Thank you for having me, Odessa. It's a thrill to be here. Is this the, uh, was this where we did the Skype last year? Yeah. So it was over here on the screen? Ah, cool. It's, it's bizarre to be here. <laughs> it was a year ago, yeah. Good. Okay, cool. Who was here for that? The Skype? Okay, now everybody else leave. You're really here, like Mick Jagger. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you thank you, thank you. Audience. Yeah. Sure. Just a little younger, but only a little. <laughs> okay. Uh, Здесь в зале много людей, кто связывает свою жизнь кино или собирается стать кинорежиссером или кинематографистом, и для них power. Ah, okay, hold on. Yeah, okay. This works. Yeah. Здесь в зале. Can you hear that translation? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, hello. I can hear you. We're all good. Okay. Здесь в зале много молодых людей, кто собирается связать свою жизнь с кино или уже связал эту жизнь с кино. Один из главных вопросов, который всех волнует, где найти бюджет и как промоутировать свое кино. Твоей дебютной картиной Пи связано много легенд. Первое. До сих пор ходят слухи о том, как добывались деньги на съемке этой картины. А еще ходит легенда о том, что вы устраивали такие промоушен акции, в частности, расписывая буквой Пи асфальт на Манхэттене. Да. Uh, расскажите, пожалуйста, о том, вот как, где вы добывали бюджет на эту картину, и что вы можете посоветовать молодым кинематографистам, как можно снять за, за oh. такие маленькие деньги? And I had uh, the limited resources I had when I made uh, Pi. I would be making a film on my cell phone camera. Uh, there was just a film that uh, was at Sundance uh, this year that is getting a full release that was shot on a iPhone. So it's finally the power, the, the difficulty of actually telling stories um, with uh you know on film is it's no longer a financial problem you know when we made pi shooting on video the quality of video was nowhere near what it is now and arguably most cameras now have a resolution that is better than what we shot pi in so there's no more excuses anymore about uh um, you know, oh, I can't get the money to do this or whatever that is. You have the power now. Everyone has the power. And if you want to do, get a little better for not so much money, you can get a camera that's a little bit better. Um, that's a 4K camera, which is enough to show on these big screens with really great quality. So the question then becomes, um, you know, now that you have that technology and that power, what are you going to do with it? And it comes back to uh, the first question is, why are we doing Yeah, the power is here. <laughs> so the question becomes, why, why are we doing this, you know? And why we're doing it is to tell stories. And it's, the old, it's one of the oldest arts of humanity. Um, people have been telling stories uh, forever, originally around fires and caves. And now we, you know, shoot fire through a lens and project it, but it's still telling stories around the fire. So what I recommend to all students I work with is r really, why are you doing this? And it should be, the answer should be is because you want to tell stories. Uh, and then if you want to tell stories, you can go the Hollywood way and tell big stupid stories. <laughs> Or 
you can remember that here you are in a corner of the world uh, that hasn't shared so many stories. And you can find a story that is true to your heart and to your soul, that is very personal, that you know, I mean, for me, the big litmus test was, will my friends in Brooklyn think this story is cool? One of my friends from Brooklyn is here, Shane. You here, Shane? Where's Shane? Where's Shane? There he is, right there. So I, Shane, I've known Shane. You can sit down now, Shane. That's good. So uh, me and Shane, uh, we've known each other since we were eight, nine years old. So I'd often think, will Shane think this is a good story? You know, will he laugh? Uh, and I knew all my friends would think what I was doing was pretty cool. So that gave me the kind of courage to work on my first film, Pi. So for you, as the young, young storytellers, it's what is the story that makes you you? What is the story that only you can tell that you think is an amazing story that people should hear? And that's why people, in the end of the day, will sit around their fi the fire of the theater or the fire of the computer and watch your stories. Uh, in mid-1990s, when you just started working on Pi, uh, cell phones were just only getting into the lives of people. They had no cameras. But still, you still could buy uh, some cameras in the shops. And uh, as far as I know, you and your DOP made several self-made cameras to make this film. Uh, why did you need to do it? Um, um, well, we didn't really make any uh, cameras. What we did is we sort of uh, used very normal cameras, very normal film cameras, but we decided to uh, shoot things in a very, very strange way. So we had one, uh, one, one camera which is pretty famous was the Snorri Cam, which was, which was basically a uh, weight belt with a tripod, with a tri um, tripod stick with a, a mount, and we put the camera on the actor's body so that wherever the person went, the camera went, which is exactly how when people are shooting their selfies now and they walk around with their selfie stick, you know, now everyone has a snorri cam with a, you know, with their selfie stick, so it's not that exciting anymore, and you see that type of image all the time. We also did a vibrator cam, which was basically all it was was a camera, and first we took all different types of vi vibrating machines. I'll let you use your imagination about what those machines were and we would just vibrate the camera, and, but that didn't work too well, so eventually we just um, just put it on a tripod and made it really strong and just shook the camera, just by, by hands. <laughs> <laughs> he, heard, he heard the thing about the vibrator cam and wanted to remove that. So, um, we just shook the camera, and, uh, and, and, that, and that became the vibrator cam. So it was, it, and uh, we had another one, which was the heat cam, which was basically, we, we wanted to make, uh, when the character was hallucinating, make the image a little strange. So we took a hot lamp and stuck it in front of the uh, camera so you get those heat waves that you see in the desert or when it's really hot. Uh, so they were just ways of uh, trying to make the image more um, more impressionistic, like a Monet or a Manet, um, uh, to express the subjectivity and the emotion of, of the actor. But back when I was starting, you could buy video cameras, but the, the video really didn't quite look like film. But now most films are shot in, in digital, and the cameras are, you know, a bit better than your iPhone. So one thing to add to the initial answer is just shooting a normal film with the iPhone is not right. You have to think about the look of the final product and try to figure out how that becomes part of the story because we're not fully just a storytelling, we're visual storytellers. So you have to think about the look of the visuals and how that helps to tell the story. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, people, the generation of the new Hollywood, remember that they used to have great influence of French New Wave on them. And when you watch your films, the first two films, I mean, The Pie and The Requiem for a Dream, uh, it seems that you felt the influence of Scorsese, because in Pie we see a story of a kind of a bur urban solitude. Uh, your characters like Travis Bickle in Science. And as for Requiem for a Dream, it looks like a continuation of another Scorsese hit. Alice doesn't live here anymore. Uh, could you tell me uh, who influenced you the most from the authors of the film? Was it Scorsese or someone else? And whether it is important for a young filmmaker to choose some kind of a flagship to walk by? I had, I had, I had many, many uh, influences. Uh, you know, you want to try to use the... Everything okay? Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, you want to um, you, you, you want to use everything that inspires you, any artist, and it doesn't have to be just uh, filmmakers. It can be musicians, uh, it can be artists, it can be photographers. Uh, not to say photographers aren't artists, but they, you know. Uh, so you can use any any anything that inspires you. But uh, there were there were many influences on all those films. And it wasn't very directly connected to any one filmmaker. So I, I think it's just about um, seeing as much cinema as pro possible. That's why something like this, the Odessa, Odessa International Film Festival, is a great thing. Because you get to see what's happening out there with visual images. But, you know, as a storyteller, you want to expose yourself to every type of art that you possibly can from from film to TV to music to art, uh, that's that's our job is to experience as much as possible because in those experiences you're always inspired by good art and then you have to figure out a way to use it and adapt it to tell the story you're telling. If you have questions, please turn your hands and you can... Let's hear from the audience. Please. the lady over there. I'll... You were, it was working. Uh, I'll try to ask in English, so Thank forgive you. me, everybody. Um, uh, maybe it, this is it, it, this is be a more uh, acting question, but uh, I think for uh, future directors it will be good. Okay. Um, what do you want to tell to young actors uh, in their future work in cinema and films? And uh, uh, which actors you, um, uh, with which actors you want to work in uh, in future? Uh, which actors you like? Yeah. Uh, how actors looks like for you? Well, actually, well, one of my actors is here as well. Chris, you here? Chris, stand up. Yeah. So Chris Garden was in Black Swan. Actually, I'm gonna Chris. Can someone bring Chris a mic? Thank you, my favorite. So, Chris, movie. you can tell. Why don't you tell them what it's like to how I worked with you on the set of Black Swan? It was a nightmare. <laughs> hey. No, Darren. Darren is. Uh, well, obviously, we're all here because because we like his work. He's a. Uh, He's a very particular kind of director. He's more, he's an auteur, so he has an incredibly strong vision going in. And uh, as an actor, he knows exactly what he wants and you're really there to serve his vision. Um, and so because of his work that he's done before, you already trust him. And then he's so confident in what he's doing as an actor, that's sort of, and there's probably some actors here, I imagine, it gives you the feeling of trust that you know he's not gonna, you know, he's gonna help you get an Oscar nomination, probably. <laughs> uh, not me in particular, but <laughs> quite a few others. And, uh, and so you trust him, so whatever he, he knows exactly what he wants and you really just wanna execute that. So he'll, he'll let the camera roll and he'll be talking to you during the take sometimes, which is really interesting. I mean, he works uh, a little bit differently than maybe the average director with actors, 
and uh, and you really have to be the kind of uh, actor where you where you trust that, uh, and he might be talking to you during a take, and then keep rolling, and then you'll try something else. And uh, I lo I love it, and uh, you know it, it really produces obviously great results. I mean, he has gotten some people some nominations, so you know that's why uh, a lot of people want to work with him. But it's somewhat unorthodox and different than than a typical director. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think Chris actually, Chris actually said the thing that's uh, the most important thing between actor and director, which is about trust. It's I, I'm lucky now because uh, because of the work I've done, I get a certain amount of trust from an actor. Um, you know, just starting, but uh, you still have to get that trust because I think actors. They, over the years, uh, you know, I, when actors start, all they want to do is to cry and to emote and to scream and to have big, passionate uh, um, uh, streetcar named Desire scenes. But then as they become more and more, uh, uh, they do more and more projects, every once in a while they'll run into a filmmaker who embarrasses them because they put their emotions out there and they're open like a big flower and then they see the final product and they're, they're scared by it because it, they, it doesn't represent, it doesn't, the, the rest of the film doesn't support what they're doing emotionally. So actors sometimes, unfortunately, start to close and get very, very afraid to share that emotion. And they'll only share it if, you, if, if it's trustworthy. So, you know, it's not about necessarily confidence alone, it's about being, uh, you know, having a comfortable relationship with an actor where you um, both um, learn, both realize that you're just trying to do the best possible work and be honest that, hey, we're all taking a risk here, but I'm going to do my best not to use you as a crutch, to rely on you, but I'm actually going to make you part of, of the fabric of this film so that when you give me uh, the, the everything you've got, it's not wasted, and there's a movie around it that is supporting it with other great actors and music and beautiful light, or really ugly light, if you want, uh, but but that it's on purpose. So, a good thing, a good a funny story is uh, when I worked with Russell Crowe on Noah, before we started. We were starting in August, and we were finishing at, at uh, the end of November. And I said, and we kind of were getting into a little bit of a deep discussion about some stuff, and he was really questioning some stuff, and I was like, man, you got it. you're gonna have to trust me on this, is what I said to him. And he said, he was quiet. And I said, you trust me, right? And he was quiet, and I said, well, when are you gonna trust me? Because it's important you trust me. And he said, probably about mid-November, I'll trust you. <laughs> Which was hilarious, because he knew exactly how to get at me, because he knew that I was just trying to forge trust, but he's a very smart man, so he knew he wasn't going to give me that, because he, want, he wanted me to keep working hard to earn his trust. So that was his strategy. Uh, but that's a very, very, you won't have to deal with that for a very long time. So, but that's, that's, that was a good, some good sophisticated uh, Jedi mind trick he was doing on me. You know, Jedi's from Star Wars, my trip. <laughs> ben Kenobi. If you don't know, you're going to know a lot about Star Wars in a very little bit. It's all coming back. Yeah. Just a moment. Requiem for Mechti was a blistering story about the lost generation. But this story was not only about young heroes. А как мне показалось, мать, которую играет Эллен Бернстайн, Берстин. Oh, you know what? I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> you can use mine. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so can you repeat that? I didn't hear any of that. А, вообще, в вашей фильмографии вы подарили две блестящие роли а, одной из величайших американских актрис 70-х, Эллен Берстин, а, и одному из лучших американских актеров 
в 80-х Микки Рурку в рестлере. А расскажите, как вы выстраивали вот это доверие с Эллен и с Микки? Эллен? Да. Да. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, let's see. Ellen, uh, so I was very young when I did Ellen because I had made Pi and Pi was all pretty much everyone in that was a beginner actor. Uh, so uh, suddenly I have Ellen Burstyn, Oscar winner, and I was terrified. Uh, I remember the first time we met, I decided to take her out to Brighton Beach, Brooklyn, the area and Coney Island and show her around. And uh, we were out on the boardwalk, which is out there. Oh, it's Little Odessa, of course. You know, that's what we call Brighton Beach. It's where I grew up. It's called Little Odessa. It's nice to be back here in Big Odessa, the real Odessa. Um, so uh, I, I, I had a camera on me, and I was actually too scared to ask her to take a picture of her. That's how scared I was. So I was for a long time in awe, but what happened is, um, you know, we did a lot of work in talking about stuff. And then uh, the f it was strange, it was kind of luck what happened. The first day we shot was we had, and it was a very low budget film, and uh, we had to shoot the scene with Tappy Tibbins, all the stuff that was gonna be on the TV We had to shoot that, you know, with the guy who was saying, who was, he, she keeps dreaming she's on the TV show. So we had to shoot that, all of that, in one day. So we had an audience not as big as this, but we had all these extras, and we were in a TV studio with, you know, four TV cameras, and there was a, a, tons and tons of stuff we had to, to capture. And she also had a, because she appears on the show different times, her and she gets more and more crazy her hair got more and more glamorous and bigger and bigger and bigger and her dress changed and went from like a kind of a shabby red dress to like sequin dress um and her makeup got more intense so uh but we blew, we did it all in one day and uh i think she could not believe how much we got done in that one day she was blown away and impressed. So that's, I guess, a good lesson. I'm looking at her still. You asked the question, right? Um, I got, they were so impressed um, by how much we got done that we got her trust. So at that point, she was like, oh, these guys are on it. They, they know what they're doing. Um, with Mickey, uh, <laughs> you know, Mickey is one of the most unique uh, human beings on the planet. Uh, and uh, I think in some ways Mickey ha had to trust me from the beginning because when I met him his career was pretty much over it took us almost a year to raise a, a very little amount of money to make the movie with Mickey because no one no one on the planet uh, wanted to um, wanted to invest in a movie with Mickey in it. Um, did anyone see uh, the movie last night, Love? Was anyone here? Yeah. You are? So you remember the police officer who talks, uh, who yeah. takes him to the sex club? Now everyone else is like, why didn't I see that movie last night? <laughs> um, that, that actually is a man named Vincent Maravel who runs Wild Bunch, uh, which he was the only man in the world who got, who understood the movie with Mickey Uh, and he's the only movie, man in the world who also would make a 3D porn film with Gaspar Noe. <laughs> so he's a very brave man. Um, so, uh, so we finally got the money, and I think me and, you know, Mickey, Mickey wants to be tough and uh, difficult, but I was lucky to find him in a place in his life where he knew I was good for him. It was kind of like medicine when you're a kid. You know it, it tastes terrible, but you know it's good for you. So he looked at me as like cough medicine. You know, every day it was like, okay, here comes your spoon, open up, open up. And he's like, no, no. Um, but <laughs> it, was, it was so much fun to, uh, to, to work with him because he can't, he, can't, he can't do anything twice. Everything is in the moment. I mean, a perfect example of like how crazy Mickey was, was, um, 
we were shooting one of the scenes, and, you know, and I tried to make it as real as possible so Mickey could just be natural. So we were shooting uh, the back, the backstage scene of the wrestlers, and we had all the wrestlers hanging out, and I was like, and I, and Mickey was outside, and I told the wrestlers, hey, Mickey's going to come in in a second, and you know he's Randy the Ram, he's one of the great wrestlers, he's a legend, and you're, but you're friends with him, you all know him because you're all professionals, so. You know, you hang out, you all say hi, you're, but, you, but he's a hero because he's been doing this for 20, 30 years. Um, and they all understood that. And, uh, you know, there were some, some of the, they call it the ring rats, who are the girls who hang out, who, you know, come out and they wear the skimpy clothes. They were there too. So Mickey comes in to the scene, I call action, and Mickey comes into the scene and he's like walking around saying hi to everyone and you can see it in the movie and everyone claps for him and... And then I start to notice he's like turning, his, he's talking to one of the ring rats and he's turning his back on me. And I'm like, Mickey, I can't see your face. But he keeps, and that, so the camera's kind of creeping around and he keeps kind of blocking the camera out. And I realize he's asking the girl for her phone number <laughs> on camera. So it was like, you know, it was completely natural and real for Mickey. He's just walking through his life, and if there happens to be cameras going on, then there's cameras going on. Otherwise, he just cannot help but be himself. Okay, so the question is the following. How has your approach changed to the visual part of the film from your very first work, Pi, to the latest one that we saw, Noah? And uh, how do you like working with your DOP in the films with very different visual style? Thank you. Good question. Good question. Um, well, I think it's always evolving. But for me, uh, I think that every movie that's well made has a film grammar that you need to figure out a language uh, that can eat that 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 tells the story the best possible way. Uh, you're also restricted by budget. So, for instance, if you're making your phone with your iPhone, you have to think about how you're going to use that tool because it's a very special type of tool. Uh, and what, on all those films, there's always budget limitations. So you don't get to have, uh, um, you know, all your lenses. You know, when, with Pi, we didn't always have all the lenses, all the same, the right equipment on set. And then on something like Noah, you don't have, you know, when it's a much bigger budget, you don't, all, you, you can't afford to have certain cranes on set and all these crazy different types of toys you get to play with when you make the big movies. Um, so you have to try to figure out all these different tools you have and how you can create a language that's best for the movie. So Pi is the, you know, since a lot of young filmmakers here, Pi is a good example of we had very limited resources. So I started off with knowing I had one friend who was not really an actor. He was an actor in college, but I knew I could, and I, but I thought he was an interesting looking guy. So I was like, okay, I know I trust this guy and I know he's gonna be there every day. So I'm gonna figure out a movie where he's the main character and he's there every day because I know I can count on him. And then as I started to develop it, I, 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 I realized that, you know what, it would be really interesting to try and tell a story purely from his point of view. Meaning that if he was not in the scene, we could not show that scene. So for instance, I was not interested in cutting to the bad guys, plotting to take over the world. I just wanted to see how that impacted him. So that influenced the way we wrote the script. But then we, it also influenced the way we shot it because I wanted to really help the audience, or I don't know about help the audience, but push the audience into his mind as much as possible. So we started to come up with a language of subjective filmmaking where when he was having headaches and he was freaking out, we would use those different cameras I talked about, the heat camera and the vibration camera to give a sense to uh, the audience what it felt like uh, to feel that type of pain. But also we would do things, so for instance, if we were shooting me and my friend here, uh, the, most TV or most movies would shoot, there'd be one camera, you know, that would shoot both of us, like a two shot, and then there'd be a single shot of him, and then there'd be a single shot of me, and that's, that's, basic, that's basic coverage, which is very important to do. Uh, because uh, y y if you have those three shots, 
If, you are, if he starts being really bad, which can happen, as you see, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, but if he starts having a bad performance, you can cut away to me. And if I start being bad, you can cut back to him. And if you want to show people where we are, you could cut back there. And that's how you put a scene together. Very basic filmmaking. Um, but I decided that uh, the other two shots I could possibly do, if I have a little more time, is I could shoot over my, ca over my shoulder. So it, it's more from my kind of view. Or, and I could shoot, sorry, over that shoulder. I could shoot over that shoulder. So those are kind of the five basic shots, right? Wide shot two close-ups, and two over-the-shoulders. So with the uh, pie, we decided, okay, since it's Max, Max's story, we're only going to shoot over his shoulder because we're telling the story from his point of view. So if we're over his shoulder, then we're seeing the world from his point of view. And then when we shoot, a, shoot who he's talking to, we want to make it feel almost like a POV, a point of view. So we move the camera more over so that it, if they look right into the lens, it's almost comedic, and you use that for comedy effects because they're looking at the audience. But we would make the other person almost look just into the lens, but just off. And then when we shot Max, for the opposite of that, we, we move the camera really to a profile or to a three-quarter so that you're looking at Max and you're, he's more of an object while that person is more of the subject to him. And it was those types of, that, and that became our language for the movie. We just used it for the entire film. Um, and that, it, that came out of, because we were restricted with budget, but also then we decided with that restricted budget to create a story that would help bring the audience into this character's head, to experience the world from his head. And the next question. I have the following question. Just imagine that one day Violence disappears entirely, once and for all. What would the film talk about it now? Uh, doesn't it mean that the film would just become dead? What type of violence? <laughs> what type of violence? Насилие как явление в целом. Войны, там, семейные какие-то, ну, все, абсолютно. Well, unfortunately, we wouldn't be humans without violence, you know. So, I mean, it's, it's part of who we are. You know, I think uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of irresponsibility with the way that violence is portrayed in movies, uh, especially in Hollywood, uh, you know, and, and that's the big problem. I think... Um, you know, without, without violence, uh, you're losing part of, uh, of the personality of, of what makes us people. So it's part of our reality. So it's not about, it's not about uh, changing all of humanity. It's about figuring out how to, um, you know, channel that stuff and to find what makes us human. So, I mean, in storytelling, I, I would say that it, we have a responsibility to portray violence uh, realistically and uh, not to glamorize it so that when you see violence on the screen, it, uh, it represents what it really is. And the same thing is with, uh, you know, with sex, like we saw in the movie last night, is finding a way to portray it realistically and truthful, truthfully and not to turn it into something it's not. So I guess, I guess you, know, um, you know, as filmmakers, it's about being honest and uh, to try and portray honest emotions on the screen. I don't know. I don't know if that answered the question, but it, he was getting a little too science fiction for me. 
you know, I guess you could give everybody a lobotomy and we could all sit there and, uh, you know, not do anything, but, you know. And next question. Very, very simple questions. How it be head of jury? Yo. <laughs> how, it, how is head, being has, head of the jury? Yeah, in it's Berlin. In Berlin. Thank uh, you. Well, I, I've, I've been lucky to be on a bunch of film juries. Uh, he's asking, I was the, just the president of the Berlin jur jury in um, February. And uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, you get to, it's anyone who, is anyone actually going to see the movies here in, uh, here in Odessa? There's a lot of good movies playing. You should all go see them. Good. So, I mean, when you're a jury member, you get to see all the movies and you get the best seats. <laughs> Uh, and also, if you happen to be five minutes late, they wait to start the movie till you show up. So that's good, too. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, I, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I love, uh, I, I, I actually often go up to the Toronto Film Festival. Toronto is a really great festival. And they show all the great movies from around the world. It's actually where I saw... Um, uh, Miroslav's uh, The Tribe, I got to see it up in, um, everyone see The Tribe here? Who hasn't, hold on, hold on, go. who hasn't seen The Tribe? Okay, it's showing 11 o'clock tonight, you're Ukrainian, it's a great movie, you need to go see that movie, it's a very good movie. Anyway, I got to see that movie, I got really excited, I got to see, um, and I, I, you just get very inspired by other filmmakers, once again, it's like going to a great museum opening and seeing great art or going to a really good concert and seeing great music. It's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of fun. And then it's a lot of fun to get together with um, people you've never really met before who are hopefully very successful in what they do and talk about movies. So like for instance, when I was on, uh, the, I, was the, I ran the Venice jury a few years before and David Byrne was on my jury from the, the Talking Heads. So I got to watch 20 movies with David Byrne, one of my heroes, you know, so that was amazing. Um, and uh, so, so it's, it's a great time. In life of each big author, it often happens that there is a project that becomes uh, like the life project and the life curse. Uh, for Francis Coppola, it was Apocalypse Today, uh, which kind of uh, bled him uh, practically to death. As for Terry Gilliam, it's the person who killed the donkey coat and the one that he hasn't finished yet. In your biography, it was The Fountain. Uh, which uh, some in the Ven in Venice festival uh, considered to be some some failure, and others uh, considered it the best film of the 2000s. And we even talked to Mark Miller today about this film, and he called it one of the best ones in your biography. Could you tell me how why it was so hard for you to create this story, uh, the story of film deter, which was made on a blockbuster scale, a story of looking for the key to understand the way the world. Works. Uh, because I tried to make a commercial movie about coming to terms with accepting death. Translate that. Oh, it didn't translate very well. But you know, you try to make a film in the West about uh, being okay with dying, it's not a very commercial idea. But you know, I get. I think the most, the exciting thing about that film is that, um, you know, Hugh Jackman will tell me that the film he gets most talked about is not Wolverine, it's The Fountain for him. And the people who like The Fountain and who get The Fountain have a passion for it uh, that is very, very, it's, uh, it's very intense. So for me, that's the great reward. It's, um, you know, you, when you, whenever you are trying to make a piece of work, it's a huge leap of faith uh, to believe that you're going to be able to communicate to people at all. Uh, but when you uh, get feedback about how emotional uh, and how helpful it was to come to terms with uh, a loved one dying, which is often what happens, it's usually about usually people who have lost someone very close to them watch that movie and they find it very, very healing or 
interesting for them and inspiring for them, that's the great reward. So uh, I always knew it would find an audience, um, but uh, it was also kind of made in a time when the most famous person in America was Paris Hilton. So uh, now the most famous person is Kim Kardashian, so things haven't changed that much. They just recast the role. Um, but uh, it, it's hard to be sincere when you make a film. Like last night when we were watching Love, uh, there was some chuckles, but it, it's a very, very serious film. So whenever filmmakers get very serious, it's often, um, it's hard, it's hard for, uh, for, for some people if they're not in the right you know, state of mind. А почему Брэд Питт так и не снялся в проекте этом? Uh, so this is a question about Jared Leto? No, oh, about Brad Pitt. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long story. So if we can get everyone in the audience a beer, uh, and we have two hours, I can tell you the story. Can we get those beers, please? Oh, the, the beers aren't coming, so next question. No, uh, you know, it was a bit, it, it was, you okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, sorry, I thought, I thought there was like some traffic going on. <laughs> Suddenly we were in an airport. Kind of. <laughs> um, no, I'm sorry, you do your job, I do mine. Uh, it was a it was a it was a long process. I part of the, there was a good lesson there, which basically what happened is, to save money, Hollywood sent me off to Australia to make the movie, and so I was halfway around the world working on the movie for about four or five months while my actor was not with me, and that was probably the lesson learned is to keep your actor close because being that far apart was 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 challenging on our relationship, but. You know, it's funny because when the film fell apart, I, uh, I started drinking a lot of gin and tonics, which I recommend for depression. <laughs> better, than better than pharmaceuticals. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time in my garden uh, working on plants, which was the first time I ever did that. And that's really, really good. That's better than gin and tonics. The reward from seeing a plant grow well is amazing. And uh, at the same time, I got a phone call from Sylvester Stallone. He was like, I can't really do it. Can, can you do it, Shane? Can you do a Sylvester Stallone? No? Hey, hey, hey. Hey. What, what did Brad do? You know, something like that. So he invited me up to his house, and, which was amazing to go up to his house. Um, you know, because, I mean, Sylvester Stallone is a big hero of everyone, right? Come on. No matter how, gee, Sylvester Stallone. He's still pretty cool. You know. Actually, when we came to the premiere of The Wrestler, he showed up. Uh, well, actually, I'll go back a second. So when I saw him, I actually started thinking about The Wrestler, uh, which would be, I, I, when I first started working on it, it was before he did Rocky Balboa, the, the one where he plays the old boxer. And uh, I thought it would be great to bring him back to the ring, and I started to talk to him about it. And uh, it, then I was sitting around, and I realized that even though this was a good idea, I still had, I still was closer, even though we had spent a lot of money on the first fountain, and it had fallen apart in a huge way, like when because Brad was growing a big beard and mustache for, uh, to do the movie. And I remember watching CNN, and you know how they have the crawl along the bottom of the thing? You have that on the news here, the crawl at the bottom? You know what I'm talking about? And it said, Brad Pitt shaved his beard and mustache. <laughs> That's when I knew that Brad Pitt wasn't doing my movie. <laughs> um, it was very, very, it was very depressing and it was very upsetting, but I realized that I was still closer to writing, writing, to doing The Fountain, so I decided to figure out a way to reinvent it for a lot less money. Um, 
So in two weeks, I locked myself in a room and I just rewrote it. And I gave it to my producer and my producer said, you know, you turned it from a big budget movie into a love poem to death. <laughs> That's love poem to death? Yeah, good. So, um, uh, so, so it was a lot less expensive and then we decided to go out and make it and uh, it was a great experience. Uh, and then, so, so out of this big falling apart of the movie, I got two projects. I got a new version of The Fountain that was probably more personal and more sense and, and closer to me. And I also got the beginning of The Wrestler. Eventually, you know, Mickey Rock became involved. But at the premiere, Sly came, he showed up, and it was a huge room like this. And I was so excited to see Sly there. I was like, oh, Sly's in the house. And you just heard in the middle of the audience, you just heard, <laughs> it was great, and the whole audience laughed. It was great. So that's it. That's the end of that story. Thank you. Lady from the back. I have a very important question so for many beginning filmmakers. What are your main ways to work with actors to bring forward the living stuff in them? How, what the stuff that you want to see in your film? Well, I think I answered that a little bit. Am I boring him? It's okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So, <clears throat> he, he, it's a, um, I, mean, I answered a little bit. It's trust. And then it's always about understanding what every scene is about. It's about um, reading the script a lot and understanding moment by moment what every scene is about. Because not only does that control what the actor should be doing, it also tells you where to put the camera. Because if you know what the scene is about, you know where the camera is supposed to be. So if the scene is scary, the classic way was you know you shoot low to make it look like a monster. If you want to look down on a character, you shoot from high. But that's just the beginning of, of that. Bitch. Of that. Did, did just some, someone say bitch? <laughs> that sounded like bitch, right? Yeah. Is that you? Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, lady uh, over there. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry, mate. Oh, that That's sucks. <laughs> Look at that. You can turn the light off on her. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. Thank you for coming to Odessa. And I have a question about scripting. How do you... Uh, so how do you organize your work on a script and what drives the story and what's the most important thing in the structure of a story? That's great. Good question. Um, hmm. I mean, there's a lot of things. It depends how the film starts. Sometimes it starts with an idea. Sometimes it starts with an image. Uh, the fountain started with the image of um, the man... Um, uh, the, the flowers coming out of the man's mouth as he died. Uh, sometimes it comes uh, from a from sort of a feeling. Uh, it, they, they come from all different types of places. But uh, I think structure is really, really important. And the best book to read is uh, Christopher Vogler's The Writer's Journey. Uh, you can write that down. You know the book? Do you know? Oh, it's great. I think it's in Russian, actually, because I think, well, I don't know if it is, but I, under, someone told me yesterday that he teaches someone, he teaches in Moscow. Does anyone know that? I don't know. Anyway, he's a, he talks about um, the, the, the structure of, of, of Western storytelling, which um, being here in the West, <clears throat> I think um, it's, it's a structure that, re, that you'll be able to relate to. And he talks about it in classic, classic ways. And even though all films don't fall into that, uh, I think it's similar to how you tell a joke, you know, which is something that's very universal. Usually, 
With a joke, you set something up, you set it up a second time, and then the third time you put a little twist on it. And I think that works in languages and in cultures around the planet. So the same thing applies to stories. There's a way of just defining a hero, uh, giving him a bit of a prop, him or her a bit of a problem, and then and then testing them so that they get to a certain place. It's the same stories we've been telling in Homer in the Greek myths. The same the same tests that we see in the Bible. So it's a it's a very ancient structure. I can't say necessarily if it's um, something we're born with or something that we're taught very young, but it's something that all people on the planet seem to react to. So thinking about structure is, is, is very important. But when you think about story, it's usually thinking about, um, once again, something you think that will impress your friends from Brooklyn. You know, and that's the people you love most. You know, you want them to be proud of you and to, in, and to entertain them uh, because those are the people you grew up telling stories to. So. Uh, even if it was a story about how you cheated it in math class, you know? It's about uh, figuring out how to entertain people with a story. So you have to find something that is entertaining. And that could be the most small things. It doesn't need to be, uh, um, you know, superheroes trying to find Thor's hammer. Uh, it can be the, 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 smallest, the smallest of stories. And that's the beauty of filmmaking, It's right? It's, um, you know, filmmaking can tra can take you into the mind of a six-year-old girl from Iran, or you know, a seventy-five-year-old man from Canada. Uh, that's the great beauty of of what we do. Thank you. What? From the person. We don't want to watch movies. We want to talk, right? Who wants to watch movies? Yeah. We want to talk, right? Yeah. yeah okay. We yeah. keep asking okay. questions. I think it's more interesting. Uh, next one question. Sorry. Sorry, can I ask a question? My name is Yuri. Uh, I want to learn to make films not worse than yours, so I have the following question to you. What is your personal understanding of cinema? Why are you making it? Apart from making the money on it. <laughs> well, you, you know, it's not, it's no, it's really not about money. Uh, that's a different type of thing. You know, um, there are people that do it just for entertainment, and then there are people who tell stories uh, that they want to tell. And the, the reality is, if you tell personal stories, you don't make a lot of money, unless you're very, very, very lucky. Um, and happen to have taste that connects with lots of people. Um, the reason I tell stories is because I have to, uh, it's what I do. I don't know why, I, I can remember when I was uh, 17 years old, I backpacked around Europe uh, with one of those passes that you can go everywhere except for Eastern Europe at the time, because it was, it was, it was 1987. So, um, and I showed up uh, at, um, I, sh I, I ended up in, uh, in, uh, in Marrakesh, in Morocco. And uh, in the middle of Marrakesh is a big square called the Gemma. And uh, in the Gemma, they have all different types of street performers. They have snake charmers and they have uh, magicians. But the thing that amazed me is there was a huge crowd around an old blind man who was on a staff and he was telling a story in Arabic and I did not understand one word, but I watched him for 45 minutes as he told this story. And he just the way, he was very old and arthritic and hunched over, but with the most little emotion, he became this giant. And everyone was captivated by this man. And that's when I fell in love with stories. Because I was like, that's, that's amazing, that power to sort of, um, you know, get try to connect everyone together to one idea and to feel and to learn so it's about harnessing that power the amazing thing about cinema is that it's something you can share with the world you know if you tell a story 
that is honest and truthful, uh, people around the world can understand it and connect with it. I remember the first night of Wrestler in Venice Film Festival. I had uh, a gray man sitting next to me. And after the show, he just got up and said something like, it's about my fucking life. And uh, I was like, Are you any, is it anything about wrestling that you did in life? And he said, you see, it's not about wrestling. So how much of a personal story is in that film? I don't know, you know, look, every story is personal and every character has reflections of myself, but in the same way that every character has reflections, hopefully, of everybody. I mean, what, once again, you, tr you know, you can only understand a character if you make them human and making them human is making them feel all the same emotions we feel all over the planet, no matter where you're from. Um, so... I, I just, so anytime I watch a performance, even if it's a ballerina, who uh, clearly my ballet is not as good as Natalie's, um, but I could feel what she was feeling. I can feel the pain, I could feel the effort, I could feel the determination. And so when I would talk to her about the character, I would try to explain it to her with things that I understand to try to make her understand with her own experience. Um, so, you know, I don't know where these stories come from and how they come out, but they're, you know, look, every single character except for Noah dies at the end of the movie or maybe dies at the end of the movie or is really fucked up at the end of the movie. Um, I wanted to kill Noah, but that was probably going too far. Uh, so, um, I don't know. I, I, there's something about that clearly that I'm interested in. Uh, but I don't know where it comes from. I just know that I find it interesting. Thank yeah. you. And next question. Let's get some people in the back. Excuse me. Um, oh, yeah. No, no. Okay, go ahead. You go. Uh, hi. Uh, I have two questions for you. The first one is, what is your favorite part in working on the movie? Is it, like, uh, creating the plot uh, or the shoots for the movie or then when you create uh, from different pieces the one piece? And uh, the second question is, do you still have uh, this excitement like you're doing your first movie before like, every, every movie? Well, that, that's a, I hate that question. <laughs> the first part was what? I know the second part very well. But the first part was what again? Your, your favorite part of your creating the movie, part. like Making creating the, the plot or it's just shoots? Well, the best part of movie, there's two great parts. Editing is a great part of the movie because it's the least pressured part of the part of the story you just sort of hang out and uh, um, you know it's it's a lot of fun the big the only problem with editing is not to get fat because you're just sitting in a room all day um, and your editor generally has terrible terrible dietary issues and <laughs> is eating really bad food the whole day so you have to sort of not get involved with that but uh, the best part of filmmaking is the moment between action and cut uh, but, you know, when you call action, every single person uh, from on Pi, eight people, to Noah, a thousand people, <clears throat> are all focused on a single image and a single sound. So to suddenly go from this chaos of getting ready to this moment of focus, and in that moment, the actor is suddenly unleashed in, uh, in, and opens their heart, hopefully. And as a director, you try to lose yourself in that moment. Um, I call it the Michael Jordan moment. Do people know who Michael Jordan is, the basketball player? All right. So have you ever seen that image of Michael Jordan floating through the air about to dunk the basketball? Everyone's seen that image, and he's got the tongue hanging out of the side of his mouth. So um, there's this one image of that that I saw. I, I never, I didn't buy it. It was a poster, and it was Michael Jordan floating through the air. But whoever shot it, shot it with a really large negative. 
And um, the negative was so large that every single person in, behind him, all like 40,000 people in this stadium are in focus as well. And you look and every single pair of eyes is staring at Michael Jordan. And they're all in a moment of awe because they're watching, they're watching someone who is completely unconscious soar and do what he's, his, what he's worked his whole life to do and be the greatest that he can be, yet he's not himself. He's, he's somehow channeling um, you know, God or the spirit or whatever it is he is channeling. It's the same thing as you know, Mick Jagger uh, doing you know, his, uh, well maybe, I don't know what rock star does that, but you know, the great musicians when they, when they channel, Jimi Hendrix burning his guitar, um, that's why we go see those things. So it's a similar moment when you between action and cut. And the goal is that, is to become unconscious to the art and just feel what is happening and be connecting it as a director. You're connecting what the actor is doing to the entire story and to the entire movie, yet you're kind of unconscious about it, but yet you're fully conscious because you're, it's, it's a very strange state. And it's a state that, you know, that I think is what painters do and musicians do, but that's that moment for a filmmaker. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Darren. Um, continuing on the editing issue, when you're in the edit, uh, how much freedom do you give to your editor? Who and how uh, do you come up with ideas like the little assembly edit sequence in Reckon for a Dream, when they kissing, selling, sewing? And uh, most importantly, probably, how do you see in the edit outside the screen? I mean, most directors, they know how much effort went into creating that particular shot. And do you let the editor cut it off if it doesn't work? Or especially in big movies like Noah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's, a good, that's a very good question. Are you an editor? I'm a filmmaker. A filmmaker. I, I do everything. Well, yeah. I have a saying. This is my saying, which is like, you're, the film isn't done until you... Um, until you cut your favorite shot. And what that means is, uh, what, what it's about is, usually it's your favorite shot for the wrong reason. It's either, it, e either your favorite shot because it's so much more beautiful than every other shot in the movie, so it sticks out because it's so beautiful and makes all the other images look crappy. Or, uh, you remember how much pain you went through to get that shot. You know, it was four, it was four o'clock in the morning and you know, 20 degrees below freezing and the car broke down and, and we still got it and it looks great, you know, something like that. Um, you have to be completely open to losing everything in the edit room. And the thing to do in the edit room is to constantly think about your audience. And uh, my mentor would always say he had a sign on his desk that said, where is my audience now? And that's what you're always thinking about is you're not thinking about your own ego, you're an entertainer. You want people to be engaged with what you're doing. And so uh, you never want to bore an audience. You want the audience to constantly be connected to what's going on or wondering what's going on or scared or laughing um, or crying. And so it's all about finding that. It's all about figuring out and being honest with yourself if this is working or not. Thank you. Next one. Um, hi, Darren. Hello. Uh, this is our third uh, time I'm talking to you, but <laughs> you don't probably remember me. I remember you very well. Okay. <laughs> last year we talked about Victoria, how right? Im important, almost. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a good guess. About how uh, it is essential to do painful things while writing a script, which I haven't mastered yet. But uh, can we dip into the characters and can you explain how to create? Um, unusual and yet very universal characters that will be understood like all over the world. This is one question, and can I ask another one? Uh, mm, can you talk of the biggest risk uh, you've ever had to take on set? The most stress? Risk. Risk, risk. Um, what type of risk? There's many types of risk. Risks of violence or risk of, uh, oh, all right, we'll figure it out. 
The first question was, uh, oh, universe, well, I, I keep going back to the same things. Uni anyone's relatable. So, uh, you know, what was interesting is taking two very strange people, a, a ballerina and a wrestler, and, and trying to prove that point, which is wrestling is such a bizarre activity, and in America it's considered the lowest art in the world. If it, I mean, most people wouldn't even consider it an art. And then you have ballet, which is incredibly... Um, you know, uh, it's 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 uh, unique in its own way, where most people don't understand what it is, and it's such a specific thing. And how do you make that relate to an audience as well? Yet, they were both relatable because you understood the passion and the desire and the ambition of the characters to to make their art, which is something that <clears throat> all people can feel uh, the, the the desire to do something well um so i think uh finding a universal character is just be, is just finding a character who's truthful and honest um but that's once again when i talk about people in this room making specific stories it's about finding those ordinary people that you think are ordinary actually looking at their lives and then you find actually that they're extraordinary because everyone's story is extraordinary it's just if you decide to put a lens on it and focus on it. That's what makes it, you know, you look at what, you know, it can be, you know, it's interesting to watch a butcher um, cut up meat or anyone who is a great craftsman do what they do. Uh, but then you have to figure out what's behind it and what makes it interesting to that person. Uh, so, so I think it's about, you know, finding people that do unique things and then uh, just really figuring out what makes them tick. As far as the risk question, um, the riskiest thing I've ever, I mean, you know, it's constantly risky, filmmaking, you know, and people die on sets all the time. And, uh, you know, just like in any occupation. So, you know, when you're doing stunts, it's really scary. You know, you really, really want to double check and triple check that everything is safe uh, because things can get out of control very, very quickly. So it's really important not to get lost in the emotion of the scene, but also be your parent, you know, have that parent voice in your head that is making sure everyone is constantly safe. Um, I, I don't think anything I've ever done, I felt anyone could get hurt. Uh, in, in a significant way. <laughs> There's people always getting hurt. I used to, I mean, most of my actors leave with at least one permanent scar. Not emotional, physical. And uh, that's, um, and, and I think they, it's about, it's about, uh, being very, very comfortable and being sure that you're as safe as possible all the time. Uh, the one story that comes to mind, though, is um, so those wrestlers in uh, wrestling, in real wrestling, actually take the scene in The Wrestler where uh, Mickey cuts himself. How many people think Mickey really cut himself? How many people think Mickey didn't cut himself and it was special effects and digital magic? No one's really voting. Is everyone asleep? It's really hot in here. Is there air conditioning in here? No air conditioning. No. It's a Soviet building, right? It's Stalin from the 50s, right? Sorry. Um, but uh, I think, um, well, Mickey, we, we had prepared a, a whole headpiece for Mickey to be able to slice so he could bleed. Um, but, you know, at the beginning of the day, I was like, Mickey, we gotta put that thing on you, but it's gonna take about two hours. You're gonna sit in the, um, in the makeup chair for two hours to put it on. Mickey, who was nursing a bit of a hangover, was like, nah, I'll just do it myself. <laughs> and he took the razor blade and he did it himself. So when you see that movie, he's really cutting himself in the forehead, so. I mean, that's risky because he can get an infection and it could shut down the film and all that stuff. But, you know, the effect is, is worth it. So that's what works. Thank you.
Could you say, yeah. Before making pie, you made about four or five shorts. How did they influence uh, your creative career? And if you came all the way back, uh, would you would would you make shorts or would you make features right away? And now talking about Mickey, second question: the hero of pie. The char Pi's main character, uh, he uh, crushes his skull in the end. So that's probably that's probably a special effects. But was he that into the film that he would have done it? Mickey crushing his skull. I, I mean, he's crazy. He's just, no. he's not stupid. He's Max, just crazy. Max, Max, <laughs> in Pete. Max and oh, Pete. Oh, Max and Pete. Yeah. Uh, um, that was a that was just an easy effect that was just um you know the the drill was it was a real drill it was a real drill bit we had shaved down the point on the bit uh and then we we made it loose enough so that it was spinning and then but so that when he pushed it against his temple which he really did it just slid into where the where the bit was you know uh, and at the same time, I was standing next to the camera with a spray bottle of blood so that when it went in, I sprayed the mirror. And that's how that was done. It was all, there was, there's no digital effects in Pi. There's no digital effect. Well, there's a, very few digital effects in Requiem. But it was before everything was so easy to do with digital effects. You know, now you can do that stuff. Anyone can do it on iMovie, you know. But back then, it was, no one had that technology. It was all still optical and non-digital. So we had to really make all those images in camera. Um, the first question before Mickey was short films. Uh, I, short films are a great, great, it's a different art form. Making a great short film is very different than making a feature. Um, but you do learn a lot. Every time you're on set, you learn something. But a, a short film is kind of like a joke. It starts off with a setup. You set it up, and then you pay it off. A feature has uh, three acts, so you have a much longer time to sort of tell a different structure. But short films are a great way to practice and a great way to get started. But once again, you can make a short film on your iPhone. So you should be out making as many as you can. And it's a great way to sort of see what connects with audiences and what doesn't connect with audiences. But if you're actually going to go out and raise money, there isn't that many places to exhibit short films. It's still a world where a successful feature film has a lot more places to go than a successful short film. Uh, but I think before you actually go out and raise a lot of money for a feature film, you should spend a lot of time playing around and, uh, and practice. It took, I mean, I was playing around with film and visual storytelling for um, 10 years before I made my first feature. And Miroslav from here, from Ukraine, uh, I think he, he's, he's made his first feature now, you know, but he's been making short films for 10, 15 years as well. So, uh, you know. And next question. Hello, Darren. Hi. Uh, it's not a secret that comic book movies have become really popular in 21st century. Uh, we have Justice League, we have Avengers, we have Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, etc., etc. Uh, what do you think about this tendency and about such movies in general? And would you consider uh, creating a comic book adaptation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, you know, it's a it's a new mythology, and uh, they're very. Some of them are very enjoyable movies. A lot of really very talented filmmakers are making them. I uh, had an opportunity to work on some of them, and I decided not to. Uh, but I think it's, um, you know, I, I think it's some of it's becoming so commonplace that it's they at a certain point they start to become less and less interesting. So it's always great when things are reinvented and done in new ways. Um, but it's uh, it's. It's unfortunate that it's become such a big part of where filmmaking has gone because, gone because they're very, very, very successful movies and it's become harder to make original films. 
Uh, so that's, it's, it's, it's strange and it's sad because when you get an original film like The Matrix that completely changes the way you see the world, you realize how important those original films are as opposed to, um, you know, an underdog and, you know, fighting for the American way, which is, uh, you know, it feeds into a lot of things that are problematic in our world. Uh, so... I, I'm very, very mixed on them, and especially where they're going, because I'd like to see, I, you know, that's, that's why it's exciting to be here in Odessa and to see what happens in Europe and around the rest of the world is um, that there's a lot more original content happening. Thank you. The black swan looks as brilliant as the wrestler. However, here you talk about the high art with a deliberately low language, with category, with B-movie language, where you seem to be influences, uh, influenced by masters such as Mario Baba. So why did you why did you take this road to portray a ballet dancer? Um, Mario Baba? Yeah. Who's Mario Baba? He's Mario Baba is a famous, famous Italian film director who's making the horror movies. Dario Argento? No, Mario Baba. Ah. <laughs> well, you learn something new every day. I have to check it out. Well, Mario Baba was not an influence. <laughs> Dario Argento was an influence. Um, I mean, that was the big problem. You know, after we made this successful film, The Wrestler, and it made uh, a decent amount of money, it was nearly impossible to get the money to make Black Swan because everyone was saying people who like ballet don't like horror and people who like horror don't like ballet. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it took a very long time to do that. I, I don't know. I, I just I think it came out of Swan Lake. Uh, at a certain point, what started off, I was very interested in Dostoevsky's The Double, which was a big short story for me when I was a kid and I wanted to do something with The Double because I thought it was so terrifying to lose your identity, especially in this world of um, where your identity is such a major part of who you are. But to imagine someone replacing you, it was something I thought was something that a scary horror film had never dealt with. Um, so I was thinking about different ways of doing it. And at the same time, I, was, I knew my sister was a ballet dancer and growing up, I was not very interested in it, but she was so focused on it that I knew that there was a whole world there that was interesting. And so I started to think, oh, it'd be very interesting to make a film about a ballet dancer. So I was thinking about the ballet movie, and I was thinking about the double, and then suddenly I went to see a performance of Swan Lake, and I said, oh my gosh, it's the story of a double in ballet. You know, there's a white swan and a black swan. It was purely a coincidence. So I was like, oh, okay. So Swan Lake is clearly a major part of this ballet film. And I started to watch ballet everywhere in the world. At one point I actually, I was in St. Petersburg and I went to see a Swan Lake and uh, the Russians put a happy ending at the end of Swan Lake. And I was like, the Russians put a happy ending at the end of Swan Lake? I mean, New York City, we have a tragedy at the end. And, and, you know, I was stunned that it was, you know, at the end, the, ball the ballerina and, the, and her prince rise out with the sun over them. I was like, ready to throw up. Um, so I knew, so I, so, and when you look at Swan Lake, you realize that it's actually, the, it's a werewolf story. You know, it's about a woman who turns into a swan at night. And so I started, oh, I was like, oh, that's interesting. The body transformation as well as these women who are so focused on their bodies to become these creatures that there's something really interesting about playing with that. So if you really look, so we started to look at Black Swan as a film take of Swan Lake. In fact, if you go through the movie, uh, the sequencing of the music, the score by Clint Mansell is in order the same order as the sequence of Tchaikovsky's um, ballet. You know, we start, we start with his opening piece and we end with his closing piece and basically pretty much it's in order. So we look very much as Black Swan as, as a Swan Lake, a version of Swan Lake, a take on Swan Lake. Uh, and, it, and, and ballet and a lot of those ballets are incredibly gothic. 
uh, by nature. So the, trans the translation of Gothic to film is horror. So it just sort of grew out of that, and, and then it became clear that we were making this horror film that was also about ballet. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, first, I wanted to say that it would be a great honor to be at your shoot, not, probably not only for me, but uh, the question is not really about the cinema. Could you tell us about several books which really influenced you? Thank you. You're, you're saying you want to come to the set? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the books that influenced me. So many books influenced me, but it's usually... Um, I mean, I, it's so hard to say. I mean, I've been reading, so I mean, The Double is a perfect example. Dostoevsky was a huge influence of me for a very long time. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, I, it, it's a hard question to answer because everything I read has something in it that, that's inspiring. And we have... Okay, hello. Hello. Um, I want to ask you a question. What is your normal day schedule? Uh, and what make uh, inspiration of you to to work like maybe some yoga or meditation or gardening? Yeah. So what? Um, oh, I don't know how to say it. It's not Okay, I think I got you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. You, you. Well, when I'm on set, it's you're basically living the movie. You know, it's they're usually 16 to 18 hour days. You're working hard. You know, when I'm not working on a movie, I generally, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to come up with ideas. So I just try to be as in the moment as possible and be as, um, and just be as open to whatever's happening around me as I can. I, you know, I don't, luckily I don't have a nine to five job, so I don't really have to uh, wake up ever. <laughs> so I kind of wake up when I wake up, and then I kind of brush my teeth when I want to brush my teeth. And then I, you know, kind of have breakfast when I want to have breakfast. So, and every day is different, you know? Mm. I don't really, I try not to have a schedule uh, that, uh, that much, because when you're on a set, you're so deeply on a schedule. You know, so today I woke up at 11 a.m. and it was great. Hello, I have the following question. Which mistakes do young filmmakers normally make? What kind of mistakes you made in the beginning that nobody told you about? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, you know, you have to make mistakes to succeed. You know that. So I think just be willing. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're willing to take the risk to make a movie, uh, that's, that's, that's probably a mistake, you know? I think making any movie is sort of a mistake. Because uh, in ret after, when, you, when you start off with an idea, you get so excited by an idea that it actually makes you kind of naive and um, stupid and you think you can do it but then when you finish a film and you look back on how many times and how many issues you had to deal with it's just endless so i don't think it's important to focus you know on what can you know what the mistakes will be it's just if you know finding that passion to make something and, and go through all of that. You need to have that internal power to do that. But I think the biggest mistakes you can do is, uh, is in the casting process. You really, really want to make sure that uh, you pick the right actors for the roles. I think the screenplay is something like 90% of what your film's going to be. If you have a good screenplay, it'll probably be even if you really fuck up, it'll probably be an okay movie. Uh, if you have a shitty screenplay, you gotta be really, really good to make that great. And then the next step is getting the right actors to inhabit and fill those roles. Thank you. Cool. Uh,
Yeah, it's almost the end. So, the last... Mm. Uh, now, poster, uh, on a poster to wrestler, there is a slogan, which is love, pain, and glory. How would you define a slogan of a filmmaker? How would it sound? Uh... It's it's a pretty. I mean, you know, it, love would probably be more passion. Um, pain would definitely be the process, you know. And it's either glory or infamy, you know. It, it, you that's the thing. You don't always. It's not always about the glory. It's it's uh, often sometimes the communication doesn't work. Um, and so, it's probably more like um, passion, pain, pain. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Odessa. Thank you all for coming and welcoming.